Welcome back to the Bible and Christian Spiritual Formation. You've reached the halfway mark and I've, I have accepted the baton from your very excellent teacher, Jan Johnson. Of course, Jan primarily worked with the Old Testament and in this final section, we will emphasize the new. But you will notice that there's no New Testament without the Old. So I hope you'll be prepared to jump back and forth between the two. There are two primary goals in this lecture today. The first is to introduce you to a concept that we will be working with throughout sections three and four of this course. It has a few different names, but to begin with, we will call it figural reading. It's a big concept and an important one. Uh, so we'll take it in small servings during this first section. Now, the second goal is to introduce you to a spiritual exercise you will engage in throughout the eight weeks of section three, and that is praying the daily office. Let's begin by talking about figural reading. Figural reading is the act of listening for and recognizing figures from one portion of scripture to another, making a sense of their connection and listening for God's voice. A phrase you will hear me repeat throughout the course comes from a now deceased biblical scholar named Leonard Goppelt, who described figural reading as not a method of biblical interpretation, but a way of seeing. Those last words are really important. Figural reading is a way of seeing. Let me cite an example from my own experience of reading scripture that I hope will describe this. Many days during the week, I pray morning prayer from the daily office of the Book of Common Prayer. And on one of these mornings, something that was probably obvious to others became an epiphany for me. Now, you'll discover that there are four readings assigned for morning prayer. There's a psalm, an Old Testament reading, an epistle, and a gospel reading. On the day in question, the Old Testament reading came from 2 Samuel 15. Now, if you remember the story, David's son Absalom had usurped the throne. The people of Israel were going up to him, kissing his ring and paying homage to him. The Bible says that the hearts of the people were turned toward Absalom. There are a lot of reasons why this happened, not the least being David's poor response in dealing with the abusive behavior among his children. It was behavior that Absalom took upon himself to punish. But regardless of the origins of his trouble, in this passage, David is now fleeing Jerusalem in order to escape Absalom. Many who remain loyal to David are with him. David is grieved and confused. He leaves to save his own life with the faint hope that God will restore his throne. We know how the story ends, though. David is eventually restored after poor Absalom is killed unceremoniously while hanging from the branches of a tree by his hair. But before Absalom's end, while the king is under duress, King David leaves the city downcast and afraid. And his departure is described in 2 Samuel chapter 15, starting in verse 23. The whole countryside wept aloud as all the people passed by. The king also crossed the Kidron Valley and all the people moved on toward the wilderness. It goes on to explain that the priests Abiathar and Zadok take the ark and follow David. However, David insists that they return with the ark to Jerusalem. And David's journey continues down in verse 30. But David continued up the Mount of Olives, weeping as he went. His head was covered and he was barefoot. All the people with him covered their heads too, and they were weeping as they went up. It's a sad and moving story. Now, I had read this story many times before, but it wasn't until that day during morning prayer that I noticed the figure that is echoed elsewhere in scripture. And I wonder if you noticed it as well. Here it is. David continued up the Mount of Olives. I was surprised by a point of geography. King David, fleeing from his throne and condemned to die, goes up the same Mount of Olives that Jesus does nearly a thousand years later. Now, if I had noticed this before, I'm sure my response was something like, wow, they called it the Mount of Olives back then too. That's interesting. What a coincidence. But this coincidence clearly didn't impact my opinion about the passage or my thinking about the passage. 
Figural reading assumes that there are no mere coincidences in Scripture. Let me repeat that. Figural reading assumes that there are no mere coincidences. If Scripture is composed by God through humans and by the Holy Spirit, then we should not find these figures as merely coincidental. What could or should one draw from this reading of Scripture? Is the Mount of Olives just a landmark that serves to remind us that the Jerusalem of David's day is the same as that of Jesus? Not at all. There's no reason to have Jerusalem's location further confirmed. Jerusalem's location is never questioned. No one has denied or would deny that the Jerusalem of David's day and Jesus were not the same. Instead, could this figure be what some of the earliest Christians described as a spiritual meaning in the passage? Spiritual reading is sometimes a synonym for figural reading. And it highlights the fact that there is something in the text and in the juxtaposition of texts worth our attention, and it may even be a word from God. Let me read that to you again. Spiritual reading is sometimes a synonym for figural reading, and it highlights the fact that there is something in the text and in the juxtaposition of the texts worth our attention, and it may even be a word from God. King David the anointed one, the king of the Jews, and the man after God's own heart, is being led out of the city to escape those who want to kill him. Those whom David loved were the ones who wanted him dead. Likewise, Jesus, the son of David and the Lord's anointed one, is led out of the city of Jerusalem to his own death. A usurper sits on David's throne, and a usurper is seeking to steal the throne of Jesus. It's not just the Mount of Olives but the procession of David and of Jesus that are figures in this reading. Again, I propose that these figures are not coincidental, that God put them there on purpose. And if we pay attention to these figures, I believe it can become an act of listening prayer. Bottom line, God meant to do this. God meant for these passages to look this way. Now to restate it, there are multiple figures in this story. The first one I noticed was the Mount of Olives. But notice, David is also a figure of Christ. Those who leave the city with them are a figure of the disciples who go with Jesus to the garden. And Absalom is a figure for all those who oppose David's kingship and also those in leadership in Jerusalem at the time of Christ's crucifixion. Not all figural readings will be this clear, but they are all nonetheless rich experiences with Scripture. Now, one final note for today on figural reading. And keep in mind, this is not really an explanation of figural reading as much as it's just drawing your attention to its existence. I am convinced that we inadvertently train people to avoid noticing these kinds of connections. I think we often encourage people to look at these connections from a merely historical or contextual point of view rather than a spiritual point of view. And I think this is especially true for those of us who are deeply ingrained in the evangelical tradition and evangelical Protestant tradition. For all of the good that we have gleaned from what is often called the historical critical approach to scripture, this is one of its casualties. And I hope to see various forms of figural reading revived within the church. One more note, figural reading is a practice with ancient roots. Christians have read scripture this way forever. To read figurally is to make connections. It is to recognize with our eyes and our ears that scripture sings to scripture. And it is God's voice that we hear singing. It is an important exercise then to look for these connections. And I'm convinced that praying the daily office is a great way to do this when coupled with the assigned readings from the lectionary and ears that are open to God's spirit. Now what follows is some instruction in history on praying the daily office. Praying and reading scripture in this way provides an environment where we can notice some of these figures that pass back and forth between the Testaments. Now for the eight weeks of this section of the class, you will pray the daily office from the Episcopal Book of Common Prayer from the 1979 version. Now, you're already praying a form of daily prayer that you developed last spring. 
In this course, I am asking you to put that aside for at least the weeks that we're together in this class and pick up a form of prayer that will be both familiar and also very strange. For some of you, it will be easy to pick up and engage in, and for others, it will be more difficult. Now, let's speak for a moment about the origins of the daily office in the Book of Common Prayer. Your assignment, as I mentioned already, is derived from a prayer book that will look a little bit like this one. This prayer book has uh, the Bible in it as well, in the world's smallest print, so it's kind of hard for me to read. Um, but you're going to be using this prayer book, the 1979 uh, Book of Common Prayer, and it dates back in its origins to almost 500 years ago and the English Reformation. And I'm just going to give you a thumbnail sketch of events that led to the creation of the prayer book. Now, I think all of you hopefully are familiar with Martin Luther, whose efforts in Germany led to the creation of a church that was separate from Roman Catholicism. Luther's ideas were flowing across the English Channel, and there were proto-Protestants in England who were inspired by his actions and ideas. However, such teachings were officially banned, and England remained a Roman Catholic country. And then in walks Henry VIII. Now, he's famous, of course, for his several marriages and for killing his wives. <laughs> his first wife was a devout Catholic woman from Spain, and Henry had no real desire to leave her or the church until she was unable to provide him with a male heir. I don't have to fill in all the blanks here, but needless to say, Henry used politics, the church, and soap opera level drama to put her away. The Pope, of course, refused to acknowledge or allow the divorce, and this led to Henry VIII's famous break from Rome. But I think it's too cynical of an outlook to say that the Anglican Church emerged solely because of Henry's desire for a different wife or different wives. In fact, the contours of Anglican worship and theology were present in the British Isles for a long time, and there was a distinctly different flavor of Christianity that existed long before the break was made official. A form of Celtic Christianity thrived there that was distinct in some ways and consistent in others with Roman Catholicism. And this form of Christianity is reflected in the prayer book that you're going to use in this class. In fact, much of what we find in the 1979 prayer book has been preserved from prayers and forms of worship that were used even before the great schism between Eastern and Western Christianity, which took place in 1064. As a result, morning prayer from the 1979 Book of Common Prayer bears a remarkable similarity to the prayers in the Western Rite prayer book of the Eastern Orthodox Church. Let the reader understand. Some of you are familiar with Eastern Orthodoxy and some of you aren't, but you'll notice that there's this fascinating connection between the two. Now, one of Henry VIII's means of separating himself from Rome was the dissolution of the English monasteries. This tragic event resulted in the destruction of houses that held religious orders. It resulted in the death of monastics and the claiming of their money and property for the crown. Now, while there was some theological reasoning behind the dissolution of the monasteries, it is generally held that it was a political move designed to quell dissent. The monasteries were international in nature and therefore loyal to the Pope. Therefore, they had to be done away with. Of course, monasteries played an important role in the life of Christian people uh, during the late Middle Ages. As you know, the most important work of monasteries was prayer, and monastics would spend their days and nights in prayer for the people in their surrounding community and for the entire world. This continues today in Benedictine and Eastern Orthodox monasteries around the globe. Monasteries in the, during this time would often receive money from the wealthy who one of their loved ones in purgatory prayed for. This was one of the theological reasons that was given to end the power of the monasteries. Now, how does all this talk of monasteries being sacked apply to the prayer book? One of the greatest gifts of the English Reformation was the empowering of the common person's prayer life. As wrong as the dissolution of the monasteries was, and it certainly was a great tragedy, um, it moved the locus of prayer from the professionally religious person, the monastic, to the common person in their home and in their congregation. 
Not everyone during this time could read, but the many who could began to enjoy the opportunities for regular hours of prayer throughout the day. These offices were the morning office, noon, evening, and compline. And the locus of prayer moved from the professional to the common man and woman or the common pastor in their congregation. It's important to stress that the Book of Common Prayer was not created out of whole cloth in the 1500s. Regular hours of prayer have been observed by Christians since the time of the resurrection. In fact, early Christians practiced praying the hours in the same way that their Jewish forebearers did. Undoubtedly, you've noticed this when you read the book of Acts. I think it's in chapter 3, where it describes the disciples gathering on Solomon's porch for the third hour of prayer. This was right outside the temple, and they did this regularly and in accordance with Jewish custom. Psalm 119 tells us, Seven times a day I rise to praise you. Now, this probably alludes to the practice of regular daily prayer that occurred in the synagogues that emerged after the Judeans returned from their exile in Babylon. When Jerusalem and the temple were destroyed in 587 BC, the focus of people's faith moved from the temple in Jerusalem to the Torah or to scripture and to worship and prayer. When the exile was over, this practice of reading scripture and prayer continued in the synagogues and does to varying degrees to this day. Now, moving back into the Christian era, we see somebody like St. Benedict of Nursia, the founder of Western monasticism. We see him commanding his monks to pray the entire Psalter each week. He began by telling them to pray the entire uh, Psalter every day, but discovered that that just wasn't practical. <laughs> These monks would gather together seven times during the day and the night in order to pray. This was their work. The Benedictine motto of ora et labora, or prayer and work, reflects this very practice. In time, the Benedictine practice moved from praying all of the Psalms in one week to praying all of the Psalms in a month. Now, the daily office from the Book of Common Prayer is an English expression of this practice of praying at fixed times during the day. It is not the only way to pray, as we all know, but it is a richly rewarding way to pray. Some of you come from Episcopal and Anglican churches, so this approach to prayer may not be that strange to you. Others of you come from the freest and most feral of churches, so praying in this fashion may be as awkward as trying to breathe underwater. Either way, I commend this discipline to you as something that Christians have always done in one way or the other, and something that we have always benefited from. In Moodle, you're going to find a document called How To, A Guide to Praying the Daily Office. It takes you step by step through the process of praying morning prayer. And the first office of the day, morning prayer, is the most complicated. It'll take the most work getting used to it. But I think this little document will help you get started. However, if you struggle, don't hesitate to reach out to me. If you get stuck, if you get confused, or if you're just completely lost, please give me a call. Uh, my friend Father Mike has said this, it took him five years to open the Book of Common Prayer for the second time. He was a convert to Anglicanism, so let me repeat that again. It took him five years to open the Book of Common Prayer for the second time. It was that inscrutable to somebody who was not initiated in it. Finally, I hope you'll engage this prayer practice with the goal of hearing God in Scripture. In fact, as this part of the course continues, I'm going to ask you to compare and contrast praying the daily office with the experience of Lecto Divina. My hope is that each practice will reinforce and enrich the other. Now, as I close, I'm going to pray for you. And the brief prayer that I'm going to pray comes from the Book of Common Prayer. And through it, I'm going to ask God to bless this work that we're doing together. And believe it or not, I'm videoing this and I forgot to look up the page, but it's on page 261, I believe. You'll be doing this a lot, thumbing through, getting lost and finding your way again. So this is on page 261 and the Book of Common Prayer. We're going to read, I'm going to pray for you, number 23, a prayer for education. Let's pray. 
Almighty God, the fountain of all wisdom, enlighten by your Holy Spirit those who teach and those who learn, that rejoicing in the knowledge of your truth, they may worship you and serve you from gener generation to generation, through Jesus Christ our Lord, who lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God, forever and ever. Amen. I do encourage you to uh, reach out early and often if you're having any challenges in this course. And I look forward to uh, our encounters through Zoom and on the phone, email, however else uh, we reach out to each other. Uh, let's stay in conversation as we do this good work together. May God bless you.